Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, so the idea that this project is based around is to study symplectic manifolds and the geometry and topology of those manifolds through the singular topology, so no geometry in sight, of a core Lagrangian skeleton. So this is not um, sort of immediately possible for all symplectic manifolds. The initial caveat I want to put on my manifolds is that they're exact, which ensures in particular that these are open symplectic manifolds. And then furthermore, I'm going to restrict to the class of Weinstein manifolds. Um, okay, it's it's isotropically stratified, yeah. So uh, I will eventually get to a point where I want to thicken everything to have top Lagrangian cells, uh, and so it will be built as a union of smooth Lagrangian pieces, and. So the, the point of this isotropic condition is that this is where the symplectic form restricted to that submanifold uh, vanishes. So there's no symplectic geometry there. And so it's theoretically possible that the topology of that singular space itself could recover the symplectic geometry. So with these Weinstein manifolds, you want to interpret the exact uh, primitive for the symplectic form. And a choice of primitive is equivalent to the data of choosing a Liouville vector field. And the duality here is that if you plug in the vector field to this non-degenerate two form, you get that primitive back. And the Liouville condition precisely says that the exterior derivative of that primitive gives you back omega. So um, the Weinstein condition that I want to place on the Liouville vector field is that V is gradient-like for some function. So if I'm given any such Liouville vector field, I can define the skeleton with respect to that vector field as uh, intuitively the set of points in the smooth manifold which don't escape to infinity under the Liouville flow. So a uh, very standard condition for the, this exact structure, or the Liouville form, is that V should be uh, transverse to an exhaustion, or outwardly transverse. In the sense that there's a set of compact uh, subsets of our manifold whose union is the whole thing, which have smooth boundary. And this vector field is uh, positively transverse to the boundary. So then you get a kind of conical end uh, outside of, once you've passed all of the zeros of the vector field, you just have this cylindrical end to your manifold. And so, a lot of the points are going to flow 
off to that infinite end uh, under this flow. And the points that get stuck somewhere form the skeleton. So this is an invariant set under V. And in this Weinstein case, where we have the taming of this function, then this is given by the union of the stable manifolds of the zeros of V. And the Liouville condition ensures that each of these stable manifolds is an isotropic submanifold. So that's the condition that we need to ensure that this skeleton is, doesn't carry any symplectic geometric data. And the topology um, kind of comes with this stratification or, or decomposition into stable pieces. So the maybe first remark that you can make is that any neighborhood of the skeleton will uniquely determine the entire symplectic manifold. Because as soon as you've captured all of the topology of the, the zeros, then the rest of it is just this cylindrical n. So you can get w omega from any neighborhood by just attaching a cylindrical n. So the deeper question is when can we recover a neighborhood of the skeleton just from the abstract stratified topology of the skeleton itself? And so, the program that I'm pursuing kind of starts out with that question as the, the first goal. So goal one is to show that all of these Weinstein manifolds have some Liouville vector field, which induces skeleton where the neighborhood is uniquely determined by the stratification. So for this, uh, this much I can achieve. So uh, I guess that's the, the statement that I can prove. And the, the main idea is to use some more spot families. And I phrase this in terms of some useful language to kind of capture the uh, Lagrangian smooth pieces. So I'll talk about these. And the, the language I've been using for the skeleton is that the skeleton which have these nice structures are built from bones which meet along joints. So I'll draw some pictures as we go along. But the main idea is that the, the bones are these top dimensional Lagrangian pieces, and they meet along hypersurfaces, which are the joints. So then the second goal is to take this class of skeleton and refine it even further. So uh, we want to reduce to skeleton where the singularities that occur come in finite families. Yeah. Okay, how big is the skeleton? Um, so 
if we have a 2n dimensional symplectic manifold, the skeleton is at most n dimensional. Um, and my preference is to restrict to the case of manifolds of compact type or uh, finite type. So the skeleton is compact. Um, but it could have arbitrary topology. Um, the, I mean, for an arbitrary manifold, um, the manifold W has a deformation retract onto the skeleton. So that's some measure of size. Um, so I want the singularities to fit into a combinatorial list. And uh, there should be finitely many types of singularities locally once I fix the dimension. So these are going to be inductively defined. and they correspond to a list of David Nadler's, at least a sort of signed version of that list, um, which was developed for sort of mirror symmetry purposes. So David Nadler calls these arboreal singularities. Because they're indexed by rooted trees, so just graphs, directed graphs. Um, and so this is a way of kind of inductively encoding a reasonable list of singularities. And what I do is to kind of realize those singularities that uh, David listed in a very natural way in this Lagrangian skeleton context. So uh, sort of reinterpret these singularities, these arboreal singularities, as a natural in the skeleton of these Weinstein manifolds. And uh, there's sort of th this language of the bones and the joints uh, relates to this arboreal situation. So um, we'll kind of see that when the joints, these hypersurfaces where two pieces meet, are immersed then this yields arboreal singularities in this context. And when they're not immersed, then we meet singularities of tangency. And these are the thing that we need to overcome. And so I've taken the kind of first steps to getting rid of these singularities of tangency by finding different representative skeletons that eliminate them. So um, change to an equivalent skeleton to eliminate these. Yeah, a different V. Um, and there's a my notion of equivalence is going to be a one parameter family of these v and their functions phi. And in fact, all of the these homotopies that I produce have C0 small effects on the, the v and the phi, and correspondingly the skeleton. Um, but necessarily have rather large effects in the C infinity topology. So um, 
the current progress on this goal is that I can sort of localize the flow of this vector field to a neighborhood of this singularity of these types. Oh, um, yes. So at the end of the day, what I would like to have is that none of these C1, C2, et cetera things are uh, something to worry about. But initially, they are. So these singularities of tangency come up with a lot of subtleties about the precise level of smoothness that is, is occurring. And so um, initially, I have to worry about all of the smooth structure involved. So um, I have sort of a way to eliminate singularities of tangency at the first level. Um, and these come in a kind of stratification of deeper and deeper singularities. So this first level is something that's uh, pretty hands-on and explicit and gives some indications about how we can work with the higher levels. The higher singularities I'm working on eliminating in joint work with David Nadler and Yasha Eliashberg. So this is joint work in progress with Yasha and David Nadler. So that's the sort of first level of existence of these kinds of uh, combinatorial singular objects that we'd like to work with to understand these symplectic, the symplectic geometry going on here. Um, so maybe I'll, before getting into the details of what these things look like, I want to just say a few things about why we're doing this and where we want to go. So the kind of next stage after existence is to understand equivalence of these structures. So all throughout, I'm working with these Weinstein homotopies where the skeleton is not unique. And there's a particular class of these skeleton with these nice arboreal singularities that are more easily understandable. But even a skeleton in that class is not unique. However, these things are going to be related through a finite set of moves. So the next stage is to understand those moves in a really explicit manner. So explicitly describe equivalence moves on arboreal skeleta. So this is going to be a complete set of moves to get from, you know, through some sequence of them from one skeleton of this fixed symplectic manifold to another skeleton. And so if we understand those moves, then we can define invariance just on the topology of these singular complexes. And that is going to be an invariant of the symplectic manifold um, if it is preserved under these moves. So there are going to be finitely many 
again, essentially because one of these moves will be induced as a kind of cobordism or concordance of a family of these skeleta, which have sort of one moment of singularity where you go from arboreal to something a little bit more degenerate and then come out on the other side with a different equivalent structure. And so maybe the first example, in the one-dimensional case, um, an arboreal singularity is a trivalent vertex. And so the first equivalence move, uh, and the only, uh, well, maybe one of the most non-trivial moves in this dimension is to go from this kind of structure where uh, the four edges meet in two pairs like this to connecting the other pairs into, a, into trivalent vertices like that. And so these will be connected by a kind of cobordism where there's a unique, more degenerate point in the center where these, this pair of vertices comes together and then breaks out in the other direction. And so as a whole three, uh, two-dimensional thing, this singularity in the center is an arboreal singularity of the next dimension up. So since there are finitely many in each dimension, there are going to be finitely many ways that we can break up those cobordisms into these kind of moves. Uh, so eventually, we'd like to try and get some new invariants inspired by cobordism theory of smooth manifolds and see what kinds of uh, smooth invariants can be supported by these singular objects, but mildly singular. Uh, and then furthermore, we'd like to use the combinatorial structure to study invariants that people are already interested in. So um, the Fukaya category of a symplectic manifold or floor theoretic, other kinds of floor theoretic invariants. These things should localize to invariants of the topology of the skeleton. And so there's work in progress by Ganatra, Pardon, and Shende to look at the Fukai category or wrap Fukai category of these Weinstein manifolds and localize them to what they call Liouville sectors. So from this perspective, Liouville sectors are like small neighborhoods of pieces of the skeleton where you keep track of where the boundary of that neighborhood meets the skeleton and where it's just kind of open. And um, then they're trying to prove that you can calculate this global symplectic invariant by restricting to small neighborhoods and just calculating local invariance there and then using the gluing data to get a co-sheaf which calculates the global thing. And so with these arboreal singularities, the associated local invariants are co combinatorially computable. And uh, so this is sort of now there's motivation for looking at these um, to compute these kinds of microlocal sheaf invariants, or which in this local setting 
give the same answer as the rad Fukaya invariants or partially rad Fukaya invariants. Um, and those things line up as um, representation of the, the rooted tree quiver. So they're objects of combinatorics uh, or, or algebra that are manageable. Um, and then they'll, they'll glue together sheaf theoretically. Well, so they, they prove uh, generation. And the, so essentially, I'm working on the geometric side with the manifolds to um, show that there are nice skeleta. And what they're proving is that if you have a nice skeleton, then the, um, the fibers, the kind of transverse fibers to the smooth strata, smooth Lagrangian strata, will locally generate the Fukaya category. So that's, um, that's the relation. Essentially, I want to draw a bunch of pictures, um, and which which represent things that are actual analytic uh, Weinstein homotopies, um, but should give some sense of what are the problems to overcome uh, in the, these various levels. So the first issue is. In fact, not all skeleta will have a unique symplectic neighborhood. And so the first way to see this is if you have a sort of index 0 minimum of our Liouville vector field, and we attach an index 2 critical point Then uh, in the sort of four-dimensional setting, we could attach this along any Legendre knot. And so this handle will descend uh, down to the three-sphere here on the boundary of the four-ball with the structure of this Legendre knot and then get coned just down to the minimum. So. That minimum's the maximum, right? What are we drawing? Um, why is it a source? Why is it a source? Probably because we have opposite conventions about upward or downward gradient vector fields. Uh, is that OK? Yeah. I'll stand on my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so I mean, there is. There is some importance here um, because we can only, yeah, so my gradients go upward. And uh, so minimum have all outwards, have you know, no zero dimensional stable manifold. And then the Leovel condition tells me that the highest index, so the largest dimensional stable manifold I can be working with, is half the dimension, n dimensional in a 2n dimensional object. So in this case, the smooth topology and the symplectic topology rely pretty heavily on which Legendre knot I'm attaching along. Now, the stratification of this skeleton, which is just built of this two-dimensional disk, 
where the entire boundary um, is glued to a zero-dimensional disk, that really doesn't see anything about the knot. So as an abstract complex, I'm losing tons of information in this picture. So the fix is that this index 0 critical point is, doesn't have enough space to kind of support the data of this gluing map. So the biggest that it can be and still show up as zeros of a Liouville vector field is Lagrangian, so in this case, two-dimensional. So if I replace my isolated zero by a, a two-disc family of zeros, then if I, don't, if I just mess around with the structure in a neighborhood of this point and keep the same attaching data up here, so I'm changing v and phi um, just locally, then when I have this Legendre knot where I'm attaching along, it's going to descend to this two-dimensional disk in a way that it, it can spread out. And so the way it falls into here is via its front projection. So I still have a four ball neighborhood of now this disk, but the point is that now that I have a two-dimensional disk worth of zeros, this is Lagrangian, and so a neighborhood of this Lagrangian disk is modeled off of its cotangent bundle. And if I have a Liouville vector field which vanishes along the zero section, then that's going to induce the st structure of a fiber bundle like the fiber bundle on the, the cotangent bundle. So the unstable manifolds of the points in the disk are going to fiber a neighborhood. And so my Legendrian knot, which is attached along this, the boundary of this neighborhood, I'm viewing this as a Legendrian in the cosphere bundle of this disk. And so when I'm, what it lands on down here is like the projection of this cosphere bundle down to the zero section and projecting out the fibers. And so I can, in fact, recover from the image down here in the disk the Legendrian itself by taking the conormal. So the Legendrian condition ensures that there's a unique, uh, oh, if I co-orient, so I have to keep track of a co-orientation on this hypersurface, but at that point, that determines a unique lift of a Lagrangian that could be coming in uh, along this singular hypersurface. Is this in any way So the link of the singularity is like a sub-manifold. In this case, it's a knot in three space. In this case, it's a projection in two space. And in general, it, the link you know, it lives in the 2n minus 1 sphere as a sub-manifold. And this is a hypersurface in a n-dimensional disk. So there's, it, first of all, like, this is embedded data of submanifolds, and um, the projection in here is showing up as part of the stratification because this stuff is is descending sort of down here. So it, that 
image is kind of manifestly being printed out in the skeleton. Um, and moreover, it's kind of less, it's lower dimensional information because you're comparing a submanifold of 2n minus 1 space to a submanifold of, or a hypersurface in n dimensional space. Great. So there are versions of this. This was kind of the index 0 case, and anything below n dimensions is going to have an analogous thickening uh, to an n dimensional manifold with some boundary. Uh, and then once all of those thickenings have been performed, then these families of stable manifolds of components, connected components of zeros, these are the bones of the skeleton. So this one's built from two different bones, uh, this smooth disk and then this disk that descends like this. And then the front projection is uh, the joint of the skeleton. And so the smooth topology of this joint where the bones uh, intersect recovers through this conormal lift the, the link of the singularity, or sort of the, the global link. All right, so then the next stage is to get to this combinatorial list. The oh so like what's the skeleton for C n? Uh, I would say it's uh, D n. So I could start with the. I mean it's not unique, but I could start with the radial structure on C n, which is just a point, um, and then uh, to thicken it to a Lagrangian thing, I would take a disk. So just make it faster. Yeah. So there's no issue having boundary. Yeah. Right. So. Um, it's kind of necessary in this theory to allow uh, kind of more spot star where star means with boundary. Uh, I mean, if you can see a disk, then what, what is the symplectic form of that disk after you do the deformation? Right. So uh, near the interior of the disk, it's going to just look like cotangent bundle structure. So. Um, it's an interpolation between uh, PDP and the radial structure, which is half QDQ plus PDP. So um, maybe the clearest picture is the two-dimensional case where, um, let's see, this is the radial structure, and this is the cotangent structure where we have a line of zeros and then um, one-dimensional fibers going out. And um, what I want is inside of a disk to have this structure and outside of a disk to go back to the radial structure. And so along the boundary, the control is that I want to take this uh, outward normal to the, to the boundary, and in a smooth bump function way, transition back into outward. So we've got this kind of vertical vibration near the interior. And then as we go further away, we go back to radial. Yeah. OK. So what are these arboreal singularities? So the first thing that we can look at is the two-dimensional case. If we thicken all the index 0 things to a bunch of intervals, then um, generically, the index 1 critical points will come in at different points with some either upward or downward direction. And 
And so if I allow myself to do generic perturbations, which I can always realize by changing the holonomy in a neighborhood of these uh, zero sets, then the behavior I get is they're always these kind of trivalent T singularities. So that's arboreal singularity number one, is the T. Um, and so in the n equals 1 case, that's the only one. And then we allow manifolds and manifolds with boundaries, so smooth or with boundary. Now in the n equals 2 case, then we're going to allow everything that happened in the n equals 1 case crossed with extra dimensions, and then some additional kinds of behavior. So here's the stuff arising from the lower dimensional case. But then we could also have two of these T shapes meeting generically like a normal crossing divisor. And if they meet transversely, then the co-normal lifts that are emanating from them are going to come out in different cotangent directions. So this is the case where we have our front projection in the neighborhood is coming in as an immersion. So we can have immersions, and generically, this will lead to finitely many types of singularities as generic normal crossing, like real normal crossing divisors do. Um, so in, in this dimension, that, that's the unique one. Um, and then we also want to allow kind of inductive behavior. So If we take a Legendrian itself, which has singularities of this uh, T type, the n equals 1 case, and then we project that down to a two dimensional disk, then this transverse T intersection is going to come down here as a quadratic tangency. So because the conormal direction determines the point in the lift, I need these to have the same conormal. Um, but this is the least amount of tangency that uh, we could have. And so this is the other kind of singularity that we allow in the arboreal world. Um, and so the way that you associate a rooted tree to these kinds of singularities is each of the strata gets a vertex. So in this n equals 1 case, there's um, like this bottom stratum and then another stratum which meets it along a hypersurface, which in this case is just a point. And so the two strata get associated to vertices. And the fact that they meet along a hypersurface means that there should be an edge between them. And it comes with a direction because these things sort of come in a directed manner by the Liouville vector field. Um, so in this case, we have the bottom most stratum here, and then two sort of equally good strata which, which meet it along hypersurfaces. And so the two half spaces that emanate from this full plane each have an equal weight edge connecting them to the lower stratum. Sorry, you're not, you're not requiring your strata to be connected now. Because, I mean, if 
you really look at the stratification, the bottom on your keyboard oh, yeah. is not, you know, it's, it's two pieces, right? It's yeah. Taken out. So how does that okay, work? exactly. So this is why I started naming things bones and joints, because initially we were starting about starting to talk about stratifications. And you're right. The stratification here is there's a like lowest dimensional stratum, and then there are these one dimensional strata, and then there are all these different two cells coming in. And what I really want to keep track of is the smooth structure that's formed by these four different pieces coming together. And there's, there's this hypersurface inside of it. So, right, the stratification uh, is like all of the data of these bones with their pairwise intersections. And uh, the arboreal graph that you associate to one of these things um, in this directed manner is keeping track of the bones and their joint relations. And that's compatible with the kind of Morse function in terms of the directionality of things. And that's sort of useful. Um, so with this guy, there's kind of this iterated structure. So is that picture that you consider a two cell for the joint intersection? Yeah, so I could, these uh, blue and green, they could have been coming from a two cell, which is attached along a knot with a crossing. They could have become. No, I mean in your dual graph. Oh. Um, in this graph? Yeah, do you, do you need to add in like a two cell for a slot into that intersection point? Or? Oh, no. Or so, yeah, so th this graph is what's associated to a neighborhood of this point, like the local structure of the singularity at that point. Um, and so it, it's encoding that we have this crossing happening there. Yeah. Um, and in this one, I want to associate a graph to a neighborhood of this point. And there, the lowest like index 0 stratum again becomes the bottom vertex. And then it has a connection to um, this piece. And that one has a connection to this, um, this other piece. And they all meet at this point. So to keep track of this, uh, the graph that we associate here is, um, has this, this guy at the top, this guy at the middle level, and this guy at the bottom. So if I wanted to see this show up compatibly with a more structure, a more global picture might look like I have an index 0 bone and index 1 kind of thickened piece, one handle, and then a index 2 that passes over that index 1. So there's some flow line from the index 1 to the index 2. And then as this flow line comes down, it's going to eventually limit onto the index 0. And so all these flow lines will land somewhere over here. And so you can gradually recover the structure of the Morse function in terms of the data of this singularity. So where the problems occur is when you have these projections onto the joints where you don't have an immersion structure. And the issue is 
that when you're not immersed, then you can't ensure that you fall into a finite list of singularity types in arbitrary dimension. So the first example where this occurs, where you're not projecting along an immersion, is when you have a one-dimensional Legendrian and the fibers, the sphere fibers that you're projecting out are transverse except at one point where you have a, a tangency. So you're projecting out here in like a, a three-dimensional space uh, by these one-dimensional circles and where you land in this projection is onto a cusp singularity. So the general model here looks like z equals x to the 3 halves. So it's like a graph uh, of this function. And this kind of 3 halves singularity is, it doesn't fit into our nice quadratic tangency models. So in higher dimensions, the analogous behavior that occurs when you project out where there are tangencies between the foliation, the fibers that you're projecting out by, and the Legendrian submanifold that you're projecting uh, get really unmanageable. And so the first stage is to figure out how to deal with the cusp. And so in smooth topology, if you're working with smooth Legendrians, the cusps that occur in these front projections are really a kind of necessary topological measurement uh, given by a, a Maslov class. And so if you want to get rid of them, you have to leave the smooth category of Legendrians. Now, in our context, we're allowed to leave the smooth category as long as our singularities are limited to these arboreal types. And so, in this case, if we, we can do a manipulation of the Louisville structure locally near these singularities, where the result looks like the following. So initially, this is some kind of um, index 2 object that's nicely um, you know, going as the smooth two-dimensional stable manifold of some index 2 critical point up here. So I want to kind of keep that nice smooth disk that's far away and introduce a platform in the middle where this can land on. Um, and so now I'm localized to a region of this singularity I want to get rid of. And um, in there, instead of having this smooth curve descend to a cusp, I'm going to replace it by a few different strata. So I'll have one piece which uh, is this kind of strip. And then to connect to the behavior that I had with this Legendrian, I have um, these pieces which come in. Um, on this platform, they come in with tangencies at a Legendrian 3D level in between, um, they'll have transverse arboreal singularities as Legendrians. And 
then when it descends onto this original disk, then they'll connect to the strip um, with these kind of two-dimensional tangencies where I have uh, one interval and a quadratic tangency of, of this other piece. And so there's something on a piece on the front, which is kind of its own stratum or its own bone. And then there's an independent strip, which is index 1. So everything's kind of flowing uh, to the center here. And then there's a, another piece on the back, which forms the back half of this cusp. Um, and so the main idea is that it's a simple idea, but it's kind of the motivation for what we need to do in the general case, which is if you're going smoothly around and you need to get from this tangent space to this tangent space smoothly, you have to cross all the tangent spaces in between. But, and, and that's a problem because we're going to eventually cross this bad tangent direction, which is tangent to the, to the foliation, the vibration I'm projecting out by. But if we have um, this kind of singular object, then I can go in happily along these transverse directions. I haven't reached my bad tangency yet. And then I'll just skip that one and come out independently on the other side. And so, by introducing a larger number of bones and larger number of strata, I gain the advantage of working in this class that I sort of already understand and has this combinatorial description at the cost of having a sort of larger number of pieces. On, oh, on this, in the immediate level? Oh, yeah, so on the level of the, cus the, like the structure of this skeleton is I have this cusp picture, and then as soon as I go up a little bit, it becomes smooth. So it's this smooth thing that's, that's collapsing down to the cusp. Oh, on this level, yeah, so, yeah, I'll, I'll draw this better. Um, so that disk gets, with the cusp picture on it, gets replaced by this picture, which doesn't look significantly better. But um, instead of having three halves singularities here, now this is the graph of something quadratic, like z equals x squared for positive x. And this is like z equals minus x squared. And uh, so the topology looks very similar. I mean, the, which makes sense because I don't want to change the homotopy type of this complex. But the actual smooth structure is considerably improved by this sort of change. Yeah. Great. So that's all I had to say. Thank you.